We continue our sharing now from the Second Corinthians. Second Corinthians chapter four, verse one. Therefore, seeing as we have this ministry, call to minister, call into ministry, the Apostle Paul, we have this ministry. As we have received mercy, we faint not. A ministry where there is mercy, where there is grace, where there is forgiveness. The ministry of the new covenant. Turn with me to the chapter before this one. Chapter 3, Second Corinthians. Chapter 3. Verse 6, the Apostle Paul wrote, Who also hath made us able ministers of the New Testament. The New Testament or the New Covenant, that's Paul's ministry. The ministry of the New Covenant. He was once in the old. There was no forgiveness. There was no mercy. It was hard. It was made for those whose hearts were hard. But now it's all turned. Since the time he met the mediator of the new covenant, Jesus Christ changed his life and made him, as he wrote, able ministers of the New Testament. Not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth life. Before it was the letter, do this, don't do that. According to the letter, written on two tables of stone, the penalties in many cases was death. No more. Not of the letter, but of the Spirit now, of the Spirit of God. For the letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth life. Then in verse 7, But if the ministration of death, written and engraven in stones, the ministry of the old covenant, ministration of death, there was no mercy, no forgiveness, ministration of death, of the letter, written and engraven in stones was glorious, so that the children of Israel could not steadfastly behold the face of Moses for the glory of his countenance, which glory was to be done away. Verse 8, How shall not the ministration of the Spirit be rather glorious, more glorious? And that's the ministry of the Apostle Paul. Back to 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 1, where we started. Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, as we have received mercy. That's what everybody needs. Mercy. All have sinned, come short of the glory of God, to come back to where we should. Mercy. And that's the foundation of the new covenant. Turn. Let's be reminded again, Jeremiah chapter 31. Verse 31. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Verse 32. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. When he brought them out of the land of Egypt and they went into the wilderness and on Mount Sinai, he gave them a covenant. And he said, this one is a new one. It's not going to be like that one. Not according to the one I made with their fathers. When I brought them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they break, although I was an husband unto them, said the Lord. But in verse 33, but this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, said the Lord. I will put my law in the inward parts. That's spiritual, not of the letter, but of the spirit. In their inward parts, write it in their hearts. But a spirit of the living God written right within us that we might be a, an expression of the new covenant, Christ. 
and will be their God, they shall be my people. Then in verse 34, and they shall teach no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord. Everyone within the new covenant, written upon their hearts with the spirit of the living God, love the love of Christ, and they will all know him, and they will not need to teach each other. He that loveth not knoweth not God, but God is love, and he will write his love in the hearts of those within the new covenant. Verse 34 again, Jeremiah 31, they shall not teach no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother saying, know the Lord for they shall all know me from the least of them unto the greatest of them saith the Lord. And look at this one now, for I will forgive mercy. I will forgive in order for the new covenant to take place in my life, he must forgive for I will forgive their iniquity. I will remember their sin no more. It's terrible. And God doesn't want us to be tormented by the sins of the past. He has chosen no more. Why did the snow? White than wool, cleansed from the crimson stain, cleansed from the stain of scarlet with the blood of Jesus. Back to 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 1 again. Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we faint not. Because of this mercy, because of this grace, we faint not. We never give up. We are not discouraged. We go forward, not in fear, but in boldness. This is what has made the Apostle Paul the man he is. It is Christ. We faint not. Look at verse 2 now. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 2. But we have renounced. Renounce means to give up, to have nothing to do with it. We have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty. No more. No more hidden things of dishonesty. No more lies. No more strongholds where Satan makes his refuge. No walking in craftiness. No more cunning. No more deceitfulness nor handling the word of God deceitfully. And you interpreting or using the word not for the sake of the truth, but to use it to deceive, using the word of God deceitfully. And then he said, renouncing all that and into the new covenant, but by manifestation of the truth. It's wonderful to know the truth. It's wonderful to speak the truth. But it is important for the truth to be manifested, to come into being, to be applied within the life by the Spirit of God, to allow. And that's what the Apostle Paul said. By the manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God, not using the word deceitfully in a way to persuade the minds of men, but telling the truth straightforward and living it up to the conscience to make a judgment in the sight of God, freely given. To believe or not to believe is the only thing. And the manifestation of the truth. And the truth is Jesus Christ. Turn with me to the Gospel of John. We've read this many times. We can't read it enough. John chapter 14 verse 6. Jesus said unto him, I'm the way, the truth and the life. 
No man cometh unto the Father but by me. The manifestation of Christ, Christ revealed in his children is the power of the gospel. See what the Apostle Paul wrote in the book of Galatians, chapter 2, verse Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. I'm crucified with Christ. It's all about Christ. It's dying with Christ. I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. He still lives. There is mercy. Mercy brings life. I live. But then he goes on to say, not I, but Christ liveth in me. The manifestation of the truth. That's the ministry of the new covenant. Not just Christ on the lips, but Christ in the heart revealed and with him as one inseparable. Verse 20 again, Galatians chapter 2. I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me gave himself for me. That's the new covenant. He gave himself for me and that made it possible. He bore my sins. He took my stripes and opened up the way for forgiveness. He gave himself for me. Turn to Ephesians chapter 3 verse 16. Ephesians chapter 3 verse 16 that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man new covenant I will put my spirit in them I will write my laws in their hearts and then in verse 17 that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. This is the manifestation of the truth. And that's what the Paul is saying. That you being rooted, grounded in love, a sure foundation. Love is a sure foundation. Love never fails. Love beareth all things. That you might be rooted and grounded in love. Verse 18 may be able to comprehend. Now you can understand. When we are rooted and grounded in love, now we can understand with all the saints, what is the breadth and the length and the depth and the height? Verse 19, and to know the love of Christ. This is eternal life, to know God, to know Christ, to know the love of Christ to know how much he loves me. And to know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge, all the knowledge would not be able to comprehend, but by faith, when we are rooted and grounded, and he dwells within us, then we understand. Which passes knowledge that you might be filled with all the fullness of God. Glory, wonderful, filled with all the fullness of God, verse 20. Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us. It's a power, it's not ours, it's his, the power of God unto salvation. Verse 21, unto him be glory in the church of Christ Jesus, throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. Back to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Let's read verse 2 again. Paul says, we have this ministry. We have received mercy. We faint not. 
We never lose hope. We never give up. We never despair. But what do we do? We renounce the hidden things of dishonesty. Let them go. Be gone. Not walking in craftiness. No longer depending upon cunning and upon the flesh. Nor handling the word of God deceitfully. Using it in a way to deceive. But by manifestation of the truth. Christ Jesus commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. Then in verse 3, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. The ministry of the new covenant is the gospel. The gospel is Christ. But if it's hidden, it's hidden to them that are lost, that do not believe that go by sight. The Pharisees who asked once, uh, once asked Jesus where and how should the kingdom of God come? And he said, it doesn't come with observation. If you go by your eyes and what you observe, it's going to be lost. You're never going to see it. The gospel is hid. It is hid to them that are lost. Turn with me. We're moving back to the gospel of John. To the same chapter 14 1 4 this is what Jesus told his disciples as he was preparing them for his departure John chapter 14 verse 20 at that day let's look at verse 19 the verse before that yet a little while yet a little while and the world see me no more. But you see me because I live, you shall live also. Hidden to the world, the world blinded to the gospel. Our gospel is hid. It is hid to them that are, that are lost. Verse 4 now, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4. In whom the God of this world, there's a God of this world, the God that the world serve, that the God of this world has blinded the minds of them which believe not. Those who don't, don't believe are blinded by the God of this world, deceived by the God of this world. In back to John chapter 14, verse 30, Jesus talked about the God of this world and said, Hereafter, I will not talk much with you, for the prince of this world cometh and hath nothing in me. The prince of this world, the God of this world, Satan. Nothing in Jesus. First John 3, 8, he that committeth sin is of the devil. In Jesus, he's clean. He's the lamb without blemish. He comes, but he's got nothing in me. And the Lord will go right through. He will die. He will be buried. He will rise again victorious. Chapter 4, verse 4 again, 2 Corinthians, in whom the gods of this world have blinded the minds of them which believe not, to blind, to deceive. That's what he did to Eve. He corrupted her mind. He deceived. She went blind. And in Revelation, chapter 12, Verse 9, the greatest deceptions of all coming up in the time of the end. Revelation chapter 12, verse 9, and the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the world, and he was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Back to verse 4, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, and now read this, lest the light, the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, Christ the light, the true light, the light of the world, John 
8, 12, Malachi 4, 2, the sun of righteousness, S-U-N, the light shining, but deception to make them blind so they can't see the light and he doesn't, Satan doesn't want anyone to see the light because in the light is life. It is the light of life to blind them, to deceive them, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine onto them. Philip once asked Jesus, and I'm back again to the gospel of John. And Jesus said, and Philip said to him, show us the Father. And he said to Philip, Philip, how long have you been with me and you still don't know it? If you see me, you see the Father. He's the image of God. If you want to know who God is like and what God is like, look to Jesus, the image of God. When John wrote in the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verse 14, look at this one. And the Word was made flesh. Yes, Word with a capital W, talking about Jesus. The Word that was in the beginning with God. And the Word was God. And now we have in 14, and the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory. The glory as of the only begotten of the Father. You see the glory of Christ. You see the glory of the Father. That's what John said, full of grace and truth. Jesus came to reveal his Father to us that we might know as much as we are loved by Christ, we are loved just as much by the Father. Jesus said, you see me, you see my Father. Verse 6, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, 4, chapter 4, verse 4, in whom the gods of this world have blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine upon them. Just let the light shine. Jesus said, when you walk in the light and the light is in you, let the light shine. Jesus said, the world will know you, my disciples, by the way you love one another. Let the light shine. Should shine unto them. Now look at this one. Verse 5, 2 Corinthians chapter 4. For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord. In the new covenant, it's not about ourselves. In the old covenant, it's about the flesh. I did this, I did that, I kept this, I did, I ate this. Nothing to do with us. We don't preach. We preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord. When the Apostle Paul met with Jesus Christ on the road to Damascus, struck down on the ground, made blind for three days, Ananias sent to baptize him, pray for him, anoint him with the Holy Spirit. He had a little boat. He had some food to give himself strength. And he went into the synagogue and he preached Christ. And that's what he said. It's always been Christ. And if he said anything about himself, it was to glorify Christ. For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves, your servants for Jesus Christ. Servants to serve, to minister, to minister as Christ did. Our thoughts go back to the Last Supper. Jesus did something very strange. The disciples found very unusual. It didn't, they couldn't understand, especially Peter, when Jesus tried to wash his feet. He said, no, no, can't do that. And he said, Peter, if I don't wash you, you can't be part of me. And Peter said, well, wash me from head to, to toe. And Jesus said, no, your feet is enough. And he went round. 
and he started to wash their feet and he taught them this lesson that they must be like the master. You said, you've seen me do it and you call me master and the servant is no greater than the master. Go and do this. If you do these things, you will be happy. In the ministry of the new covenant, we are servants of Christ. Everything for Christ. In the old, every man is a master. Trying to outdo the other. Second Corinthians chapter 4, verse 6. For God, who hath commanded the light to shine out of darkness. Wonderful. The very first thing that God did that the word that the Lord did right back in the book of Genesis chapter 1 verse 3 and God said let there be light how easy is that all of God speaking and there was light and likewise, God speaks again, a light greater than the light that lights up the way so our eyes can see, but a light for the soul, a light for the spirit, a light for heaven. For God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness hath shined in our hearts. That's where he wants to shine. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice, open the door. Let the light shine. When the door is open, the sun comes in. The darkness just goes. Where did it go? It just went. It can't stay in the light. Let's read it again. For God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Christ. We beheld his glory as of the only begotten of the Father. Christ. Christ in you, the hope of glory to give the light of the knowledge of the, of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ, to shine in our hearts the ministry, not Christ in the heavens. We have to ask someone, please pray him down. Someone go up and get him to come down and listen to me. Oh, Christ in the grave, which is even worse. Dear, please, someone try and rescue him, save our Savior. No, Paul said, this is not the faith that we preach. But the word is nigh you and your lips and in your heart. Not Christ in the heavens or Christ in the grave, but Christ in you. The glory of Christ in the faith, shining in our hearts. Let the light shine. Let Christ live in us. Second Corinthians chapter four, verse seven. Listen to this one now. But we have this treasure. It is a treasure. It is a priceless treasure. It is an eternal treasure. It will not pass away. It is forever. It is ours forever. It is the only thing we can say we can keep when we leave this earth. We have this treasure. We have this treasure in earthen vessels, in jars of clay. What a humble vessel. What a great God of mercy. When Adam followed his wife and Adam 
lost his faith and believed and obeyed his wife. God spoke those sad words to him, thus you were. And this is earthen vessels, jars of clay. Genesis chapter 3 verse 19 he told Adam in the sweat of thy face shall thou eat bread till thou return unto the ground for out of it was thou taken for thus thou art unto thus shall thou return thus clay earth and the unspeakable treasure in jars of clay. Turn with me to the book of Psalms. Again, we see the same thought there, Psalms. 103, Psalms 103, verse 14, one four. For he knows our frame, he remembereth that we are dust. Verse 15, as for man, his days are as grass. As the flower of the field, so he flourishes. Verse 16, for the wind passes over it, and it is gone. And the place thereof shall know it no more. But then in verse 17, but the mercy of the Lord new covenant in this ministry we who have received mercy we faint not but the mercy of the lord is from everlasting to everlasting upon them that fear him and his righteousness on the children's children but we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. Second Corinthians chapter four, verse seven. Turn with me to Colossians, Christ, about Christ. Chapter two, verse three. In whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. It's all in Christ. This excellent this this treasure that cannot be measured that is the greatest treasure of all the whole world what is it to profit a man who gains the whole world and loses his own soul misses out on this treasure and it's in him i hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge and look at this man of faith called Moses, adopted son of Pharaoh's daughter. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 24. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 24. By faith, Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He turned away from us up high position right up to the top of the land he refused and the reason why verse 25 choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of god he chose the affliction he chose the hardship he chose the trials then to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. The pleasure of sin is only for a season. It is here, it will be gone. It is temporary, it will not last. And Moses knew that. Then in verse 26, esteeming the reproach of Christ, he saw the suffering of Christ, he saw the offense, he saw the crucifixion, esteeming the reproach of Christ, greater riches than the treasures in Egypt. He said the cross is more precious. The trial is precious because of the cross gave up all the treasures of Egypt and didn't cry or regret. 
for he had respect on the recompense of the reward, he saw what was coming up. He didn't look at just what he was going through. He looked at what was coming up. He had that faith that it is better to be a child of God than to be the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Treasures in jars of clay. How amazing. And when we see treasures in jars of clay, we never look at the clay. It's the treasure that catches us. We never look at ourselves anymore. It's not about us, like the Paul said. We don't preach us. We don't preach about the vessel. Ah, oh, this jar of clay is a really good jar. It's a very strong jar. No, it's all about the treasure in the jar, Christ. That's the ministry of the new covenant. And he said, we have this ministry because as we have received mercy, we faint not. Now, let's move very quickly as we come to the closing. Look at verse eight. Read verse seven again. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. Not of us. No. Paul said, God forbid that I should glory save in Christ and in crucified. No more pride. Uh, no more being proud of things that he's did. No longer looking at the vessel, understanding this is dust. We are here at his mercy and he has made us jars to contain these treasures. Verse eight, second Corinthians chapter four, we are troubled on every side, not distressed. We are perplexed, not in despair. Persecuted, verse nine, not forsaken. Cast down, not destroyed. Verse 10, always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is the glory, the greatest glory revealed in Christ and him crucified. When John cried in the revelation because he thought no one could open the book, a elder told him, look at the lion of Judah, the root of David. He looked, he saw the lamb. It was slain, but it was standing. It was dying, but it was living. And this is the eternal treasure, the most precious treasure of all, what he did for us. The, that the life also of Jesus may be manifested in our body. Let his dying, that his life may be manifested in our body, the life of Christ. This is the manifestation of the gospel. Verse 11, for we which live are always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh, the flesh that will die. These jars of clay, let the glory be revealed. Verse 12, so then death worketh in us, but life in you. As Christ died for us, so we too for others. Verse 13, we having the same spirit of faith according as it is written, I believe and therefore I have spoken. We also believe and therefore speak. When a person believes, he can speak. And that's why Paul is, blow, uh, is bold. This is the word of his testimony. We believe we can speak. Verse 14, knowing that he which raised up the Lord Jesus Christ shall raise up up us also by Jesus and shall present us with you, the resurrection of Christ. We know this. Moses knew the pleasure of sin for a season. He looked beyond that to the reward forever, to the resurrection. Verse 15, Second Corinthians, Chapter four, for all things are for your sakes, that the abundant grace might through the thanksgiving of many redound 
to the glory of God. All things are for our sake, for the glory of God to be revealed to others. All things were good. He's talked about trials. He's talked about terrible things. He's, he's spoken about being persecuted, being poor, forsaken. But he said, it's for us, for our sakes. All things are for your sakes, that the abundant grace may through the thanksgiving of many redound to the glory of God. Then in verse 16, for which cause we faint not. He said that at the very beginning, because of his mercy, we faint not. And he reveals this mercy in the glory of God, in Christ Jesus, this treasure in earthen jars, we faint not. But though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. Hallelujah. It's the inward man, the spiritual man, the man of the new covenant. And in verse 17, for our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. The affliction. He called it light, but it was pretty heavy. If you look at Paul, if you look at what he went through, you'd say, that's not light. That's not a light affliction. See what he what he wrote in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23. He said, are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I'm more. In labors more abundant. In stripes above measure. In prisons more frequent. In deaths often. He's just giving us a list. He said, I've been to prison more times. And he, and he says like this. He said, I speak as a fool because he doesn't, he doesn't want to talk about it, but he's doing it just to reveal to them what he has gone through and for the glory of the Lord. And then he starts to list it in verse 24. Of the Jews, five times received I 40 stripes, save one. Five times I got beaten 39 times each time. 20, verse 25, three times was I bitten with rods. Once was I stoned. Three times I suffered shipwreck. A night and a day I've been in the deep. Verse 26, in journeys often, in perils of water, in perils of rubber, in perils by my own countrymen, in perils in, by the heathen, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils amongst false brethren. Danger everywhere. And he says, light affliction. Verse 27, in weariness and painfulness, in watchings often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness. And we're amazed, but more amazed when he said, our afflictions are but light. Back again to what he said. Verse 17, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, our light afflictions, which is but for a moment. It's a long time to go to prison five times, to be beaten with rods five times. That's a long time. But he said, it's a moment because that's the way he sees it in the eyes of faith, in the heart of faith when he sees the glory and the exceeding reward and what's coming after, he said, that's nothing. Worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. He had enough to complain about. He could murmur about everything. We could even join in and say, yes, Paul, I think you're right, but he knows. Never will he do that. He's proud, and that's what he's proud of. God forbid that I should glory save in Christ and him crucified. And it's all about Christ and him crucified and joining with him in this way by faith. Our last verse this morning, while we look not, verse 18, while we look not at the things which are seen, when you move by faith, don't go by what you see. 
or by what you think or by how you feel. But the things which are not seen when you move into the new covenant, you're going by faith now. But you can see very well now. You're walking in the light now. You can see the light. You can know Christ. You will preach Christ. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporal. Whatever we go through, all the afflictions that he went through, temporal, won't be here, will be gone. But the things which are not seen are eternal.